Hello, and welcome to another season of Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. On this edition of the show, we'll meet a university professor who writes to help writers. And we'll meet a talented, incredibly versatile singer-songwriter. And of course, we'll hear his music. So let's get started. Rebecca Lee calls Windsor home, but works across the river as an associate professor in reading and language arts at Oakland University in Michigan. Rebecca has received many awards in excellence for teaching, all from American universities. And among other things, she teaches writing and leads writing workshops. And she joins us now to discuss her book, Wounded Writers Ask, Am I Doing It Right? Rebecca, welcome to Scribes and Songsters. Thank you for having I, me. I really appreciate your taking the time. Yeah. Now, do you live on the other side in Michigan, or and do no, you still I live, live here. here? I live here in Walkerville. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah. I have to say, uh, wounded writers ask, um, "Am I doing it right?" Yeah. Um, I've gone through this a lot, as you can see, yeah, and went through it again because. I know that we have limited time and I couldn't yeah. decide for a while uh, what we're going to talk about. Yeah. But I thought what I'd like to do is to start with when uh, I read um, that your major area of research yeah. is how art serves as a pathway to literacy learning, yes. how illustration study supports students as writers. Yeah. I thought that sounds absolutely incredible. How? How does all that happen? Well, um, most of the students that I, most of my students that I work with are either pre-service or in-service teachers. And a lot of them come with um, a lot of, you know, different narratives, different stories about how they became a teacher, why, why are they interested in becoming a teacher. And of course, they've chosen a profession in which they're going to do a lot of writing, teaching writing. Mm -hmm. But they themselves have a lot of reluctance to do that. And so um, whether I'm working with students or whether I'm working with children, the best way to uh, make a, a writer or a student feel like a writer is through art. Because art is one of our first science systems that we come to know as children, right? And when you're exploring with color and you're exploring with texture, if you're playing with paper and you do collage, there's no, or there's limited, um, that self-censoring, right? That, oh, I'm gonna be writing, what am I gonna be writing? You're thinking more about, you're trying to make meaning colorfully, right, and aesthetically. And from that, then you get all these ideas, and it's kind of a way to lure a writer into the notebook. Um, and, you know, as yeah. you say that, um, there's a picture in my head. Yeah. And, of course, you know, uh, we as children, but I know my own children, yeah. I mean, the first thing they do is yeah. even when they start doing their letters, oh, they sure. use crayons. Yeah, sure. And so there's all that color in their lives and their lives absolutely um and you do get some students who say well i'm not an artist i'm also not a writer but i'm not an <laughs> artist and so then so you're trying to do um in chapter three in this book about aesthetic gifts you're trying to encourage them to explore um the kind of arts where you're not making anything proportionate you're not trying to to you know draw a landscape or you're not trying to make anything representational mm -hmm. it's really about color and texture and line how important is it to teach humans how to write? I think it's very important. Um, I think most people would say it's fair to say that, you know, over the years we have, uh, as a culture, we write less, you know, we, um, we don't deliver as many cards as we might have. And if we do now, we really leave it to hallmark inside the card to mm. express what we are feeling, right? Whereas in, you know, days past, we would have taken the time to write a lengthy note. But, um, but I think writing will always be important. Um, it's how you come to know uh, how you feel about something. Um, in fact, Donald Gray talks a lot about that. Um, in teacher education, he was uh, one of the forefathers of writing. And uh, he said, you don't know what you know until you write it. And we live that mm -hmm. and we feel that every time you set to write something, you're like, that's not what I meant. And even when you're looking for a card in a store and you read the sentiment, you think to yourself, that's not what I want it to say. Right. Even though you're not writing it, you are contributing to that by selecting one card over another. Um, we text it. Some people will argue and say that's not really writing, but it's a big part of our culture uh, to text, to to tweet, to 
uh, have a post through social mm -hmm. media. Now your book, I love the title, Wounded Writers Ask, mm -hmm. Am I Doing It Right? Yes. So two things, explain the title and are you a wounded writer? <laughs> uh, well, the title actually grew out of, um, I was giving a, a presentation at a conference, a literacy conference, and I was working with um, adult writers. And um, I would say about eight months prior to that, a student had said to me, jokingly, you know, I think you should <laughs> write this book. And so it was at that conference where the light bulb came on and I thought, hmm, maybe I could do this, right? And so I asked all the attendees and I said, you know, if this was a book, what do you think the title should be? And so one lady said, well, I think it should be, am I doing it right? Because we're constantly asking you, are we doing it right? And that's what you're trying to disrupt and dismantle. So I think that's what it should be called. And there was a feeling of like, yes, I think she's onto something. And then on the flight home, I thought, well, who asked that question? Who really asked that question? And of course it's wounded writers. Mm -hmm. So that's how the title came to be. Um, and of course I wanted to play on right because um, I think when you're trying to break down that state of writer woundedness or, you know, that internal censor that we have, that critic who says, you're not writing it right, you're not doing it right, that story's not good enough, you can't share this. Um, in order to kind of dismantle that, you have to practice a lot, an awful lot. And so that's why I wanted the emphasis on the word right rather than R-I-G. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, was just, it was quite good. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And the, uh, you asked, um, am I a wounded writer? So I can say yes, but writing the book, I didn't think so. In fact, I didn't entertain the question or idea, mm -hmm. but I was, um, I was at a school assembly and the mother of a teacher, um, I was sitting beside her and I had just met her and I found her quite intuitive. And we were just having a five, 10 minute conversation and she said, so you're a wounded writer then? And she was the only person who had asked me that yeah. question. And I thought, yeah, I, I think I am. I think there's a part of me that is. So um, rather than, you know, try to avoid it or, or deny it, just kind of embrace it. Um, I never had teachers that openly came out to me and said, you know, negative things about mm -hmm. my writing. And the way that I talk about in the book, I say, um, you know, how you become a wounded writer is either through it over the years of teachers saying, uh, making commentary about your writing, um, whether it's explicit or implicit, and you just internalize that as I'm not good enough as a writer, um, or you just have so many memories of rules about how writing has to be. You know, you want to write that one story about X, Y, Z, and the teacher says, no, we're going to write stories about A, B, C. So mm -hmm. I think that contributes to writer woundedness. And I think I fall more in that camp of just wanting to write certain stories, um, wanting them to be different, and, and memories of teachers saying kindly, but gently, no, <laughs> uh, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to write, you know, something else. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's so much in this book. So I thought what we might do is take each of the chapters. Okay. And then um, there are a couple of things that I'd love to focus on. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with chapter one and chapter okay. one. Core so stories. what's the focus of core stories? The self. So core is all about yourself. Um, when I'm working with really young children, they're like, no problem. I can write about myself all day long, right? Yeah. And then when I work with older writers, um, often we talk about something about your childhood, um, something you remember in school. And so that's how we dovetail back into that. Um, and then, of course, uh, adult, uh, my my, sir, my pre and in-service teachers, they'll dibble dabble in their, their personal um, everyday life, the relevant life. Um, so the core stories are all about yourself. Um, yeah. Now, there was something called Six Word Memoir. Yes. I love it. Yes. So tell, tell the audience six about word, it. So Six Word Memoirs, uh, they've been around for a really long time, and you can change it up. You can say do a 10-word memoir or five, right? It's really a, the number is a constraint that you're working with. And, um, and you're trying to say a lot in so few words, whether it's six or 10 or so forth. And so um, sometimes I have, I work with writers and I say, tell me something about your life in six words, not more, not less, mm -hmm. exactly six, right? And so you get some students who say no problem and they just run with it. And then you have other students who they say, well, you know, I'm like 34 years old or I'm 40 years old or I'm 16 years old, <laughs> like that's too intense. And so then I say, okay, well then tell me, tell me something about your life from last night in six words, or tell me something that happened last week or something pivotal when you were 10. And then 
um, I find students and they just have a much easier time doing that. But you're really trying to say a lot. And so it's it's an exercise in brevity, really, um, which older writers get. But younger writers are like, what's that? Yes. And then they so then, then they feel it in six words. Yeah. Do you know, in my journalism classes, leads, the yes. you know, leads are very tight. Yes. And so Twitter is, is not something that I want them on all yeah. the time. Right. But what is really cool is yes. I make them write their leads on yes. Twitter. Oh. And so they can't write, oh. you know, 10 lines. Yes. And so that brevity, yeah. yes. I, I think, really Essential. does hone the thought process. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it was, I'm, I'm going to do a terrible job quoting, but I think it was Abraham Lincoln that said something about, you know, why use five when you can use three for words or why use four when you can use two or, yes, you know. So, okay. Yeah. Chapter two, joyful nonsense. Yes. And the do's and don'ts yes. in that chapter. Yeah. How cool. <laughs> that make you so that comes from Todd Parr, and that's a board book. And one of my favorite things to do is to take um, books uh, and, and ideas that are meant for really young children and make that relevant for older readers and writers. Uh, my um, licensure is with high school, so my certification is secondary. And so I love to show adolescence things, picture books too, that are really meant for an older audience. You get such great writing ideas. Um, and so Joyful Nonsense is about all the fun, silly writing that kids I want to do. I know they want to do. But um, there are teachers who think silly has no place in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, when it's the perfect warm up. Yes. It really, really is. And you're, we're surrounded by list writing all the time. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, songs and lyrics are lists. And so it's a great genre to get kids going, especially the most reluctant who said, I'm not here to write. And you're like, great, no problem, because we're just going to do a list. Yes. And then that list become, begets another and another. So it's playful and fun. Sometimes students end up with a really great name for a character or a story direction or an idea. So um, it's, not, it's not a wasteful chapter. Students go back and they find good stuff in there to develop a bigger story. Now, you mentioned Chapter 3, The Aesthetic. Yes. yes. In there, Newspaper Blackout. Yes. That was brilliant. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's Austin Kleon's work. And he was inspired by um, Tom Phillips, who wrote a book called The Humament. Uh, it's actually the human document that he put together. And that is visually rich and stimulating. It That's a book really worth taking a look at because he used um, acrylic and paint and gouache to cover up words, whereas Newspaper Blackout is just... Um, uh, black Sharpie basically over the text and a lot of his work um, he uses the economic times so he has these beautiful stories some about love some about relationships and people pets you name it and they're all well not all but mostly coming from dry sections of the newspaper <laughs> and um, and then again I, that's another one that I like to use with kids who say I can't write and so that's fine let's just redact well, let's cover up or uh, circle some words and then we redact and cover the rest and then this beautiful poem emerges. Yes. And it, they do own it, even though those words, they didn't write them, but they found them, they discovered Because they them. created yes. that structure. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was really wonderful. Thank you. I know we're running out of time, okay. but chapter four, uh, word craft. Yes. And um, so the people will have to read this because yes. fat, muscle, and cholesterol. Yes. Oh my, how cool. Yeah. And then try 10. Try 10. Those yes. things like Take a topic were... and rewrite it 10 different times. Yes. And the fat, muscle, cholesterol, that one's a fun one to use for, you know, what do you know a lot about? You know, you know a lot yes. about cooking, you know a lot about hunting, you know, right? And so you have to figure out what is the fat, muscle, cholesterol yeah. of, of any particular topic. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people find this book? Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, you can find it also on uh, Barnes & Noble. And um, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at Wounded Writers Ask. Thank yeah. you so much. My we pleasure. could talk another half hour. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> this book is certainly worth a read for anyone who has an urge to put words on paper. Coming up. We'll meet singer-songwriter Max Marshall and hear about his exciting plans for the coming year. But first, here is a music video of Max performing a song he wrote called The Oak Island Money Pit. Scotia, where we plan on getting rich. We'll hit the course and drop our pitch, rob that jackpot money pit. 
When we pay ourselves on surface, once we finished up the gig, I find my perfect hidden moment. I'll push my partners in the pit. And down we go deeper than the rest. Or I lay upon my treasure's chest. But hunger lends itself to murder, filling up your lungs with water. Stone or timber, or those ancient Spanish scissors. Bought me out some golden bread. I'll never work a day again. Yeah, I fell down to the bottom of the well. Where I laid upon those skeletons' hands. I swear I gave the gold away just to live another day. Kid myself, like those who outdid themselves, from the egoist to the exorcist, and all of those who claim it counterfeit. For all of you who's made this myth, you'll only gloat until your broke cause more goes in than it ever comes out. Oh, more goes in than it ever comes out. Oh, more goes in than it ever comes out. Corners and soil sealing off. Max, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to talk about, by the way, I really like your sound. And I did go online and listen to um, a number of uh, your music pieces. Thank you very much. And I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So I want to talk about all those fascinating things you've got planned for yourself. Yeah, yeah. But uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, well, born in Windsor, Ontario. Um, I lived in Windsor for about 25 years. And then like many people who reach that stage of living for a quarter century need to get the heck out of wherever they're <laughs> from. Uh, moved to Toronto for a little bit, spent some time in Montreal, uh, relocated to Newfoundland for a few years. You went to Newfoundland? I lived in Newfoundland, yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. be still my Newfoundland heart. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, I know that you play all kinds of music, but mm -hmm. let's sort of go back to young Max. Sure. Now you started uh, music very young. I was seven, yeah. I, uh, I, well, I remember my mom signed me up for soccer and I scored on my uh, own my own team, and was heavily damaged <laughs> damaged by the ridicule. And so then I decided to play guitar, and um, and uh, then uh, when I was about fourteen, uh, we started playing. Well, it's my first appearance in a bar, and we had a really funny thing that we did. Is back then pre internet days, um, we were able to just phone these drinking establishments and say, "Hey, can we book like?" Friday the 12th and they'll be like yeah sure of course and then we show up and we're all 14 years old he was so upset um but uh, he let the show continue put x's on our hands and kicked us out right after so yeah, yeah young start to it all so you did you form a band uh, at that time yeah um and then I was an uh, upright bass player, played a lot of jazz and classical and bluegrass and always in an accompaniment uh, situation. And then I think, um, you know, believe it or not, moving to Toronto, um, I got really heavy into ragtime guitar. And I, I don't want to say it's completely this, but just the portability factor of a guitar in, in a big city. Yep. So I put the upright bass down and um, went back to the guitar. It's lighter. And, yeah, it's lighter. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, and the style that I was able to um, come into, uh, you're using your thumb as your bass and it's contrapuntal because you have your other fingers to, to play the melody line. So there's two things happening at once on the guitar and it's a bit of a brain bender. It took, took some time to be able to do that. Uh, but now I'm so in the genre and, I, I, and it's an exhilarating way to play the guitar. Yeah. Now, do others do that, or is that something unique to Max? Uh, no, it's it's definitely an established style. Um, I think in the folk community, um, you'll see people finger pick quite a bit. 
Um, I'm trying to go a little bit further deep into it. Uh, I would consider myself, uh, this is what I say to sound people when I get to the show. Mm -hmm. This, it's, I'm not just a singer-songwriter because people have this prejudice against uh, someone up there with an acoustic guitar that give you, you know, maybe 60 to 70% vocals and then only 30% guitar, where the guitar is quite a bit of my show because that's my shtick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. so now, where did the interest in ragtime come from? I mean, young people don't necessarily just gravitate to ragtime. No, I, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw my parents, uh, I'll throw my parents a, a reference of always having some John Lee Hooker and some Mississippi John Hurt, all old fingerstyle players. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really got me was hearing um, a guy named Blind Blake. And Blind Blake um, recorded prolifically in the 30s. And of course, the ragtime um, era was abruptly finished, I would say 1936, because of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And then all of those Columbia, Vocal Eye, and all of those record industries dried up right away. Um, but you listen to these recordings, um, and it sounds like two people are playing at once. And then when I realized it was just one person, I'm like, I, r I have to do this. And that's kind of what really drew brought me into, into it. So you've got a record coming out. I do, yeah. So tell us about that. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm really excited about it because <laughs> I just don't want to really write about me anymore. You know, let's say if you suffer a heartbreak or a death in the family, uh, you know, the therapy of writing about something is there for the taking. It, it, it does make you feel better, but like a snake trying to put its dead skin back on, you got to relive that every single time mm -hmm. you perform it. And you're not always heartbroken. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but um, so for this particular one, I'm really interested in other people's stories. I'm really interested, and that's the beauty of uh, touring across Canada is in Europe, you get a chance to when, when people take you in as a guest, they kind of give you the best of them for that one night. They're going to tell you, they're going to bust out all the finest stories for you and, and they're going to give you all of their best stuff. And I'm really receptive to that. And it's kind of the Robert Munch thing because that's what Robert Munch did. All of Robert Munch's books were all stories that he heard from families like, and then he writes them. And so that's that's the real thing for me. And, and for this particular album, um, I've got a really great whodunit as far as... A, uh, the, the type of story it's concerned um, with uh, a bear poacher in, in um, Manitoba. I got a great story um, about a guy who uh, ruined his life um, trying to purchase uh, hockey cards and flip these hockey yeah. cards. So, you can do that? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. This guy ruined his <laughs> life with hockey, just yeah. chasing the, this idea of completing the set. And then the set was devalued by the time he finished the set. It's beautiful. And uh, well, not for, not for him. Him. <laughs> not for him. Um, yeah, uh, I've got a great story of uh, meeting um, a guy who installs uh, wind, like big giant skyscraper windows. Um, they dropped a window and it was just like on the edge of my seat listening to this stuff. And this is all real things that happened. And so that's what I'm really that's what I'm really interested in right now. I don't think I've ever, uh, you know, had a conversation with someone who actually took those kinds of stories mm. and put them to music. I think it's fascinating. Oh yeah. I don't suppose Thanks. you did anything about a moose in Newfoundland. <laughs> I, luckily I haven't had to because if I, I think if I did end up having a run in with a moose, I don't think I would be yeah, here to tell no. the story. You know? <laughs> so uh, what kind of um, music are we going to hear, you know, of all the, the genres you have in your uh, arsenal? Well, um, you know, I'm trying to just, served a song with it i i, I uh, for this particular one for a long time i was very like guitar oriented and then i would put the words in after and you know in this particular case um a lot of the tonal choices a lot of the harmonic choices are dictated by the tension within the story um and you know i feel like at this phase right now i'm realizing that i you know there's absolutely nobody getting famous i don't have any illusions of grandeur I'm just really doing this to serve the story and um, and you know uh, if they have a hard time figuring out what genre to put it under the streaming platforms perfect you know yeah 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 that's it's it's for it's for that so you're yeah. off to Europe eventually yeah the uh, Europe has been pushed back I was gonna do it in the fall um, and uh, instead what's happening is in the fall I'm going back to Quebec for a month Europe's getting, being pushed back until 2020 
and um, Quebec. Uh, it's a really, really, really great market. Um, I feel like it's untouched by a lot of Anglophones. There's this weird cultural divide where Francophone doesn't think they can tour Anglophone areas and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so for the last about five years, I've committed myself to just going to the smallest, weirdest little places in Quebec and showing up. I don't speak French. And, and you sing in English. I sing in English, but just it's a very strange thing for that to happen in yeah. those communities. And it's kind of the Blue Rodeo thing because Blue Rodeo established themselves just by going to every single little town. Or maybe it's initially the Stomp and Tom. Thing. Brilliant musicians. Though. Oh, oh, great. I love Blue Rodeo. But, you know, no. where, I mean, 90% of Canada is rural. It's small communities. Mm -hmm. and, and those communities make up so much vast cultural identity of the country. And those are the places musicians should be going to, you know. Yeah, I'm excited to go back. I bet you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, so you're doing all this touring. Do, do you have another job or are you making a living? Um, well, I uh, have a very low cost of living, uh, mm -hmm. but I am full time music. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is really great. I, I mean, it well, you should see my tax return. It's nothing special. <laughs> no. it, it's exciting. Well, Windsor Essex has a really unique situation because um, not only is it an affordable place to live, but there's a surplus of bars and restaurants that have had that have a good budget. That's for covers. But it's been happening since the 80s. And so Windsor Essex has a lot of full time musicians. Um, but here's the caveat of playing music for a living is you got your Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You've got 72 hours, only 52 times a year to work which is a wow. real kick that in the... that math is pretty uh, profound. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the tricky part about it all, making it work and, and stuff like that. But so far, so good. And you've got two little ones? I've got two kids. Yeah, yeah how old are they? A four-year-old boy and a one-year-old girl. So are they impressed with dad? Well, uh, they don't really realize how cool dad is quite yeah. yet. <laughs> but by the time they're old enough to realize how cool dad is, they're never going to think no. I'm cool. No. So... I, I hate to have to say it's time to go, yeah. but where can people hear your music? Uh, yeah, you can see me at maxmarshall.org. And not only do I have all my dates there, but my music as well, with some cool updates that are happening too. Good luck. Thank you very much for having me. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. As usual, time is always too short when we're talking to interesting people, but we'll do it all again next time. Big thanks to our producer, Brian Sweet, and technical producer, sound guy, etc. Gary Glass, a heartfelt, grateful thank you to the Toldo Foundation. And of course, the biggest thanks to you. Join us again when we'll introduce you to more of the talented folks who call this area home, right here on Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Bye for now.